talk about behavioural problems, particularly in the older cat. And I have to say that I've been in practice for more years than I'm going to divulge. Um, but Sue certainly knows how long it is, because she knew me when I was still at university. And um, really, behavioural problems in any of our domestic species when I went through university really were unheard of. Um, we talked a bit about aggression in dogs, which of course is hugely popular nowadays, um, but cats didn't have any behavioural issues at all. Um, I, I was joined in my practice by my first associate, Linda Horn, in 1994, so she's actually just celebrated 20 years of working with me. And she was one of the first veterinary surgeons to take the behavioural postgraduate diploma with Southampton University. And I have to say thank you to her and acknowledge her contribution today to most of my presentation. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think this is this depicts the revolution in the time since I've qualified. That not only are we now talking about behaviour in cats, we're actually even talking about medical problems in cats. When I was at university, at the end of every lecture, there was maybe a paragraph of what happens in cats. And I've always been very keen on um, keeping up with new things and what's up to date. And in the early conferences I attended, the buzzword was that cats are not just small dogs. So I liken the revolution to the technology revolution. When I was at university, mobile phones were that size. <laughs> so, <laughs> cats are not just small dogs. So, what am I going to talk about today? Some of it overlaps. Um, very conveniently for you, because it means I'll be talking less with um, some of Joe's presentation today. Um, but really, what I want to um, talk to you about is how we can recognise, treat and manage behavioural problems, what we as veterinary surgeons can do to help you as owners and what you can do as owners to help. And I'll also focus on a couple of particular issues um, as well. Uh, I think Joe has already really touched on this. There is a very close relationship between medicine and behaviour. And when we as veterinary surgeons are presented with any behavioural problem, it is absolutely vital that we check there is no underlying medical problem. Any behaviour that is out of character could suggest an underlying medical problem. And this is even more important in the elderly cat, where pain, sensory loss, hormonal changes, or any condition which makes them feel more vulnerable is much more likely. Um, I'm, compared to dogs, behavioural problems in cats are really very underreported. Um, and um, if the, it is often me in the consulting room that asks the owner if there are any behavioural changes. And it's only when I suggest that to them that suddenly the cogs start working. So I think we need to think about how a, a medical problem may actually um, exhibit itself as a change in behaviour. The most obvious example is, has sort of really been alluded to by Joe, a cat with arthritic hips that can no longer jump onto the chair or onto the work surface. Or the cat that starts drinking out of the toilet, or the washing up bowl maybe, because actually it's got renal disease and needs to take more water on board. Less obvious is the cat that um, starts to hide away and um, is losing weight because actually it's no longer a, it's got heart disease and it's no longer to, able to exercise properly. And a case I had in my consulting room only a couple of weeks ago was the cat that was over grooming. The previous veterinary surgeon had put that all down to stress. When we X-rayed the cat. It had a very, very severe spinal arthritis. And actually, when we started to treat the arthritis, the overgrooming went away. So these sort of common behaviours, I think all of you as cat owners and breeders will sort of recognise. And these people quite commonly come in um, for our advice for. But some of the changes are a bit more subtle. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, this is not a subtle picture. Um, but some cats just become more reclusive. And if you already have a nervous cat, um, would you necessarily recognise when some of these um, behaviour changes were happening? 
And obviously you're very experienced cat owners, but you've got to remember that the people that we deal with day to day are not all like you. And it's also important to remember that cats are both predators and prey species. And as such, they're totally dependent on themselves for survival. I'll come back to that in a minute. But becoming less active um, and withdrawn and quieter than normal can indicate some serious medical issues, just as much as change in toileting habits can. Um, they can't afford to display any signs of weakness in the wild. So what do I really mean that, about cats becoming more dependent on themselves for survival? Sorry, they, they are dependent on themselves for survival. Um, and this is because in the wild, cats are solitary hunters compared to dogs, which hunt and live in packs. So if a dog becomes ill, then hopefully it can actually um, depend on its pack mates to, for its survival whilst it's getting better. But in the wild, the cat doesn't have that option. So they really have to protect their signs of illness. Um, obviously, in our domestic situation, we care for our cats, but cats are still have the instincts of, wild, of their wild ancestors. So their instinct is still to hide away. Um, aggression actually is the last resort of a cat um, because that then means that they are overtly open to injury and therefore they become more subject to being preyed on. So that's why in cats we tend to see these behaviours of anxiety in a multi-cat household much more so than we see in dogs. Quite frankly, if two dogs living in a house don't get on together, they just bundle in like this cat and this dog. But cats they tend to start toileting inappropriately, over-grooming, um, those sorts of behaviours are much, much more common in multi-cat households than they are in dogs. So, one of the things that I think I do need to harp on a little bit about is the importance of the veterinary surgeon in the behavioural issues in cats. And the veterinary surgeon really should be looking at using all these sorts of methods to try assess whether there is an underlying medical problem. And successful treatment of any underlying condition is absolutely crucial to successfully treating the medical condition. And I'm sure you've all used and heard of fellow way diffusers. You can put as many of them in the house as you like, but if you have an underlying medical condition, it's not going to do the trick. And therefore, you think the fellow way is bad. Um, so in my practice, we always start by taking a full history from the owner and perform a full clinical examination. Now again, as James said, in the consulting room, the cats behave very, very difficult, differently, and some cats are quite difficult to handle. There's, only, there's a limit to what we can get from our physical examination. So the history taking is really, really important. We're very dependent on what you as cat owners tell us. So we may spend, in a 20-minute consult, 15 minutes talking and five minutes on the cat. So it may feel as though you haven't got very much value for, for your consultation because we've only spent five minutes with the cat, but what's the point in carrying on hand with a stressed cat? Um, the reason I'm sort of harping on about this is because there is a, there is a tendency for some um, cat owners to go straight to the animal behaviorist um, without seeing the veterinary surgeon first, and I don't think that any of the behaviourists should be seeing these patients without having a veterinary referral in the first instance. The, the clinical examination may not yield us enough information, the history may not yield us enough information, and one of the other mainstays in our practice is our blood test analysis. And quite frankly, without bloods, we are like cats without the tail. Blood evaluation is a bit like having a window to look into the body and they can, it can often give us unexpected results. All cats over seven, year old, seven years of age can benefit from blood tests and it is amazing how healthy some of the oldest cats are but on the other side it's also amazing what blood tests can reveal. So if we 
Georgia had to just depend as on our clinical examinations as we did when I first qualified, then quite frankly, chronic kidney disease was only really recognisable um, when it got to a grade four. So that's the cat that's off its food, dehydrated, lost a lot of weight. And optimistically, those cats can only be expected to survive for a few months. Detection of early renal failure in studies one or two, one or two, allow us to take measures to help significantly slow down the progress um, and prolong life expectancy. Um, there are other things that we can do in our investigations, and I'd like to tell you the story of this little cat. This cat was presented to us for inappropriate toileting. And it would have been quite easy in a busy evening surgery to have just palpated the cat, done the examination, and sent it away with some fully weight. But fortunately, one of my vets did notice that the left kidney felt slightly enlarged. And our obvious conclusion was that there was probably some sort of kidney disease. So we went through the blood tests, and the kidney function tests were okay. So then we went on to imaging, and you can see where all the red arrows are, the enlarged left kidney, and this is a kidney affected with lymphoma. Um, from there we were able to go on and ultrasound it, and take biopsies of that kidney without actually having to do anything too invasive surgery-wise, and we successfully treated the lymphoma, and therefore the behavioural problem. So, toileting problems are really, I think, the biggest thing that we get as far as behaviour is in cats. And um, they um, usually they're sort of inappropriate toileting indoors because a lot of cats are um, encouraged to go outside. So, let's have a think about some possible medical causes of inappropriate toileting. And I'll touch on defecation first, as that tends to be shorter. Um, and gastrointestinal disease is one of the most common causes of cats going for a poo in, in place in appropriate places. And that may be simply they're getting caught short if they haven't got an indoor litter tray. But also cats, if they have got um, an upset tummy and they experience pain going to the toilet, they don't tend to like to go back to the toilet in the same place because they think it's going to hurt again. So if you've only got one litter tray, they tend to go somewhere else other than the litter tray. Um, both, both peas and poos um, can be obviously affected by arthritis. Um, cats have to adopt two completely different positions, one to go for a pea or with a flat back and one with a really arched back to go for a poo. And if they have arthritis in their hips and spine, that can make it quite uncomfortable for them. Um, and a recent study has shown that more than 90% of cats over 12 have a degree of arthritis. And considering we don't think 12 is old for our cats anymore, that's fairly significant. So let's go to urination. Um, one of the most common medical causes of urinating in inappropriate places in cats is urinary tract infection and idiopathic cystitis, both of which cause increased frequency of urination and pain. So for the very, just like with gastrointestinal disease, they associate going in the litter tray with a painful experience, so they choose a bath instead. Um, renal disease, chronic kidney disease, this is the most common medical problem in geriatric cats, and it causes them to drink a lot, urinate a lot, and lose protein in the urine. This fact makes them much more, pro more prone to urinary tract infections, and so the cycle goes round and round. Another really common geriatric problem is hypothyroidism. Actually, probably the second most common in this country, although it does vary around the world. This also causes them to drink more and urinate more, and can cause them to urinate inappropriately. In fact, hypothyroidism can cause a significant number of behavioural uh, manifestations, so that's something that's going to keep cropping up as I go on. So, <laughs> fat cat syndrome. Now, apart from the genetic predisposition in Burmese, which we've all learned about this afternoon, diabetes is actually becoming a really common medical condition in all breeds of cats and deserves a special slide all on its own. Um, it seems to be associated um, with obesity in cats, uh, very much like type 2 diabetes in humans. And we do think there is the same sort of good life um, problem here going on in cats. Um, 
Nowadays, more people keep their cats indoors, or at least restricted, for fear of them getting run over or in cat, in cat fights. And of course, it's very convenient to have a cat if you go out to work to leave dry biscuits down. Big bowl, and they full of concentrated feed for them to graze at. And, um, and then they just get fatter and fatter because the dry food has, is so concentrated. They're not going out the doors catching mice and rats, so they're not getting the exercise. And this whole vicious circle starts to implode. And these cats become couch potatoes. They don't want to exercise. And eventually they will get diabetes. And even though, even though in these dry food diets there's still no carbohydrates, they still get diabetes. Diabetes itself may cause inappropriate toileting because they have to start drinking much more to dilute, try and dilute their blood because their blood is like golden syrup full of sugar. Um, but also their urine contains sugar as well. And that makes a great medium for bacteria. So it makes them more prone to urinary tract infections, which causes inappropriate toileting. Urine spray is actually a behavioural issue. But of course, many cat owners can't actually differentiate between spraying and inappropriate toileting. So that's our job to really try to get to the bottom of it. Um, so having ruled out any med medical issues, um, this is our sort of truly number one stress behaviour. Um, and it may be that we see this when we have too many cats living in one household. It may be that the cat is having stress from other cats in the neighbourhood. And funnily enough, yes, even though they have, they have those other cats are outside, um, they still will start to spray the house. And of course, cat flaps are great because that just means the outside comes in. Um, hopefully, usually it's just the environment that comes in and they can smell the other cats on the outside, but obviously you all know sometimes the other cats come in through the cat flap as well. So though we obviously Owners have to try to take measures to try and reduce that. Um, if you've got a lot of cats in your house, they're not going to want to obviously find homes for some of the cats, and that, so that it does become difficult. If you have got a lot of cats in the house, it's really important to, to distribute the important resources all over the house um, so that that the, each cat can access its food, water, litter tray, bed, where it can get a bit of time out from the other cats in the house. And it's quite hard to convince owners of this. You know, people think that they have a cat litter tray until the cat's six months old, it's neutered, then it goes out. And then we say, well, no, actually, you need to put a cat litter tray in the house. Actually, if you've got two cats, really, you need three litter trays in the house, one each and then one alternative. Um, if you've got six cats in the house, where are you going to fit seven litter trays? Um, on top of that, again, food as well. They will compete for food. Some, some cats will be too timid to come up to the food well and will get bullied by the other cats. So plenty of food and watering holes. Um, we can use some of the products now for this sort of situation to help manage. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with Feliway, it's a pheromone, um, which is it's an analogue of the pheromone that's produced by the oil glands in the cat's forehead, where the cat rubs around your legs or in the house. Um, and that's available in two forms, as a spray or a diffuser. The diffuser, I think, is the much more efficient um, formulation, because unless you forget to <coughs> replace it when it runs out, um, it's being it's available all the time, but the spray is really useful for when you're travelling a cat um, as well. <coughs> There's also another product, a fairly natural product, a food supplement called Zilken. Um, Zilken is a milk protein product, and it is has been formulated so that it's like has, the, has the, it's like the protein that's in the cat or cat's milk that makes the kittens feel sleepy after they've fed. So it tends to relax the cats very well. Obviously that's having to medicate your cat and that's another stress factor. Where there's severe anxiety, we can use drugs as such. 
Um, and the two anti-anxiety drugs that we consider using in cats are Clomicam and Amitriptyline. I would just like to tell you a little story about Fellaway, which I'm sure the manufacturers won't be very pleased to hear me bring out into the public. But I had a cat with a very, very serious weight problem. And this had been going on for a year, and we had tried every diet, every exercise plan, and I had got to the stage of saying, really, I'm just going to have to have a cat in for boot camp because this is getting desperate. It's carried over eight kilos. It's a normal domestic short uh, moggy. Um, and um, actually, the owner had a bit of a problem as well. She's slightly agoraphobic um, and also had a weight problem. <coughs> so we sort of made a plan when the cat's going to come in for boot camp. And just as she was leaving the consultant room, she said to me, could I have Anyway, refills, please. And I said, you know, let's just try without. And the day we stopped the fellow way is the day that cat started losing weight. So I think this cat was overdosed for fellow way in the house. <laughs> Interestingly, I think the owner was as well because she started to lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> So this is another behavioural issue that, um, that clients come and talk to us about, the cat that sits down at down <coughs> 3 o'clock in the morning, the morning wailing at the wall. Um, and there are a lot of medical reasons that can cause this. Um, pain from anything, arthritis, dental disease, cystitis, gastrointestinal problems, anything that wakes us up in the night could actually be happening to the cat as well. Hypothyroidism classically causes restlessness. These cats are always hungry, always on the go. So they sleep for a little while and then they're wanting more again. Renal disease can cause a cat to wake up in the night because it's always thirsty. Um, likewise, diabetes because they're hungry and thirsty. It is also, this is also a feature of senile cognitive dysfunction. It is really important to address all these medical issues um, and also to remember that actually we can make this worse. The cat wakes me up in the night, I'll go down and feed it and I'll pet it and make a fuss of it. And actually, they like that. So mm -hmm. they learn that that's the way to go forward. So actually, you may have to shut the cat out of the bedroom. Um, but at the same time, obviously, make sure there's easy access to water, food, litter tray, and a nice, cosy substitute for your bed. And it is quite difficult to manage for an elderly cat that's been used to sleeping on your bed. Um, uh, getting them to be more active during the daytime helps. Um, now, obviously, I don't necessarily expect us all to be doing our gymnastics every morning, but you know, you've, you know the feet, the, the feet activity toys and catnip toys and laser toys and things like that. Um, and again, anxiety treatment in the form of fully ways ill can or medication, strong medication can help. Um, reduced appetite is obviously can be a problem with dental disease. Increased appetite and, and accompanying weight loss can be seen in diabetes or hypothyroidism. Again, the cat that's normally fed on the counter to keep the food away from the dog if it's got arthritis it's not going to get up and be able to find it so easy to get up on the counter. And um, this can just simply be reflected with very, very subtle signs. Um, and I think we should always remember if you see any sort of behavioural issue, um, is this cat in pain? Um, I'm going to skip through some of this. This is arthritis. Um, this is an arthritic elbow and the ways of sort of recognising arthritis because this cat is not going to be holding its paw up just as Joe alluded to earlier. But dental disease I'm not going to skip through. Dental disease is a very, very common um, cause of well-hidden pain in cats. And as cat owners, actually, we often try to ignore dental disease because we're frightened. We're frightened of putting our cats under general anaesthetic to treat it. But I would just like to remind you that anaesthetic safety is, has improved hugely, rather like the mobile telephones. Um, we have much, our modern anaesthetic drugs are much, much safer. 
Um, we monitor them much more than ever used to be done. Certainly when I first qualified, in my practice, we only have a qualified nurse monitoring anaesthetics. She has the help of machines um, and she's sitting there and doing nothing else other than the anaesthetic. These patients nowadays also are supported with intravenous fluid therapy routinely, um, just as we would be if we were going into hospital for an operation. Um, again, that's something that never used to happen. Um, the other problem with dental disease is that its effects can be underestimated. In those horrible teeth there are living bacteria, and as the gums become inflamed, the little blood vessels, superficial blood vessels burst. And I'm sure you've all seen you know, bleeding gums with a smelly breath. And that allows a route for bacteria to get into the bloodstream. So the immune system is being stimulated all the time in the mouth and trying to stop that from happening. But it does eventually get through. And those bacteria can then cause sepsis. And those bacteria can settle out in the kidneys. They can settle out in the heart. Um, so don't underestimate um, dental disease. and don't be frightened. And um, the cat that suddenly goes blind, that may be associated with diabetes, high blood pressure, renal failure, hypothyroidism. These cats that do lose some of their senses, it's really important to allow them to use their other senses to the maximum. So, you know, if you've got a blind cat, don't keep changing the furniture around in the house. Use gentle touch. Make sure that if they can hear you as, that as well, they can hear you coming, don't suddenly stimulate them. And again, because they get quite disorientated, the Felly Way diffusers work really well for these sorts of problems. As I alluded to earlier, aggression really is the last resort. Um, and they, it's huge, often it can be a result of an underlying medical condition, more so than actually having too many cats in the house. Um, but it may be also a result of um, cognitive dysfunction syndrome, hence the miserable old git. Um, it's very difficult to treat these sorts of issues uh, apart from avoidance. Try to avoid anything that sort of may stimulate um, the cat to become aggressive. So let's talk about feline cognitive dysfunction syndrome. Now this is senility, really. Um, any or all of those clinical signs may be present. And a study found that 28% of cats aged between 11 and 15, and 15% 15 of cats over 15 have cognitive dysfunction syndrome. It actually is very similar to what we see in dogs and also in humans, and actually the figures for humans seem to be much worse. Um, the decline of the grey matter is well documented in us, and it all starts at the age of 35. And it not only affects our brains, but all our body systems, our nerves and our muscles and our bones as well. So, age is great, isn't it? Cognitive dysfunction syndrome, as I say, can, produce, can cause any of these signs. Um, so, it, it, that, this supports really why it's so important to rule out the medical conditions first. Um, treatment that owners can do at home um, is to really sort of try to increase the predictability of the routine and to increase mental stimulation in the form of play and normal, normal toys and things. This probably is a bit excessive, but I found this on, as an image on, uh, on Google for Burmese, so um, this is obviously it's a Burmese that had, lives a full and active life. <laughs> um, there are no licensed drugs for treatment of this problem. Um, there are nutritional supplements available, um, and there are also some foods that are particularly high in antioxidants. And I think my own personal recommendation for this is to make sure you don't buy huge sacks of dried cat food, um, because the antioxidants degrade really, really quickly by small bags and seal them. Um, there have been some anecdotal reports um, of the use of some drugs such as celgene and um, for um, cognitive dysfunction syndrome in cats. So we've talked about this already. Um, and dental disease is obviously one of the possible predisposing factors um, for this problem. But um, it can also happen um, other, with other factors. We think caliche virus infection, oral ulceration, primary vaccinations, 
cutting of permanent teeth, recent dental treatment. So I'm sure some of you have seen this, but this is the behaviour rather than the horrible sore face that becomes the result. Thank you very much for listening to me.